tended to drift westward and hit the Brazilian coast. Hence the Brazilians now speak Portuguese. And the Portuguese pushed on from India into modern day Indonesia and the Malaccas or Spice Islands. They reached Japan, they might even have seen the west coast of Australia. The Portuguese Empire was one of the early European empires to grow because of the spice trade. Now by this time, following Columbus's route, the Spaniards had reached the mainland of the Americas. The first European to set eyes on the eastern Pacific Ocean was the Spanish explorer and conquistador Vasco Nunes de Balboa, who crossed the Isthmus of Panama, then known as the Isthmus of Darien, and in September 1513, Balboa, having three years earlier founded the first permanent European settlement on the American mainland of Panama, climbed alone to the peak of a mountain and for the first time saw the South Sea, or what is now called the Pacific Ocean. Four days later, he and his men reached the ocean, waded into the sea to claim it and the lands that it touched for Spain not of course knowing how much land was touching this ocean. That's what say, they used to call an amber claim. He also found a fortune in gold, ornaments and pearls. Now Balboa clearly left his mark. For example, those of you familiar with San Diego in Southern California will know of Balboa Park. It's a wonderful place, now the site of the city's finest museums, the famed zoo and botanic gardens. But when the Panama Canal opened in 1914, Balboa Park was the venue for the Panama California Exposition of 1915-1916. And they of course recently observed the centenary of that wonderful event. Unfortunately for Balboa, while he was making his mark in the Americas, the Spanish king had appointed a new governor for the territory who considered Balboa a rival. This was despite the fact that Balboa was actually married to one of his daughters. He framed Balboa for disobedience and treason. And in 1519, Balboa was beheaded together with four of his lieutenants. The Spaniards were not satisfied with their conquests in the Americas, which they saw as just a stepping stone to the Spice Islands. The Portuguese and the Spanish were in serious danger of going to war with each other over their new conquests. So they negotiated a treaty by which the world was divided along a line that generally reflected the colonial possessions of the time. Now it takes a bit to imagine that both the Portuguese and the Spanish could carve up the whole world to themselves, but that's what happened. And the Treaty of Tordesillas came into being. There was both a religious and a political aspect to this in reaching the agreement and you may sometimes find this referred to as the line of demarcation or the papal line of demarcation having been sanctioned by Pope Julius II. And this map shows the dividing line in the Atlantic and again shows that slice of South America where Brazil is being chopped off into the Portuguese section. section. I'm curious that if you continue the line around the world that Australia actually gets carved up too in this process. In effect, the Spanish were then prevented from going east around Africa to get to the Spice Islands. They always had to go west and the Portuguese could go east. So that's what the treaty meant. The man who turned the Spanish ambition to reach the Spice Islands into reality was actually a Portuguese aristocrat. Ferdinand Magellan. Born in 1480, Magellan has sailed with Portuguese expeditions around Africa to India, Malacca and the Spice Islands. And later, of course, he was accused of trading with the Moors and the Portuguese king refused to employ him again. So he renounced his citizenship and offered his services to Spain. No strong allegiances here. In August of 1519, Magellan set sail from Spain with five ships. He planned to sail down the east coast of South America, looking for a strait that would lead him to the new ocean. It was to be a very difficult voyage. 
In April 1520, off the coast of what is now Argentina, there was mutiny on two of the ships caused by the decision to spend winter there on reduced rations. Some of the ringleaders were executed for their trouble, and one captain was beheaded and quartered. Later, one of the ships was wrecked in a storm. The remaining four ships made their way through a channel which became known as the Strait of Magellan. And you'll see that there marked up here, the left upper left corner of the slide. But one of the ships deserted and later returned to Spain. So in November of that year, 1520, the three remaining ships entered the ocean which Magellan named Pacific Ocean because of its stillness. They were the first ships to transit the Magellan Strait, a journey that in the future was to prove much quicker than sailing right down to the far south around Cape Horn, down here. Until the opening of the Panama Canal in 1914, the Straits were the main route for steamships travelling from the Atlantic to the Pacific Ocean. An alternative route, the Drake Passage between Cape Horn and Antarctica, is turbulent and frequented by icebergs, far more treacherous. Magellan's ships then sailed northwest across the Pacific Ocean and eventually struck the Marianas and Guam. On the 16th of March, they landed on one of the islands of the Philippines. And Pierre Magellan successfully won over some of the local leaders. But in a battle on another island, the Spanish had to run for their ships and Magellan was hacked to death. The survivors had insufficient men to man three ships, so they continued in two of them and decided to go around the world via Africa and to return that way to Spain. Then one ship became unseaworthy and, it, and some men remained in the Malacas. The expedition continued on with one ship, commanded by Juan de Elcano. In September 1522, the ship Victoria arrived in Spain with a crew of only 80 men, more than three years after it had set off. The Victoria had on board 26 tons of cloves and cinnamon which was sold for 10,000 times the original purchase price. Yeah. And this allowed all of the sponsors to cover their costs of the voyage, and indeed make a profit. It had been a remarkable voyage. It was the first expedition to circumnavigate the globe. It had proved that the world was round, but also that the world was larger than previously thought. The voyage also found something else. It established the need for an international deadline. Upon returning to Spain, the ship's crew found their calendars were a day behind, even though they had faithfully maintained the ship's logs. However, they did not have clocks accurate enough to observe the very slight lengthening of each day while they were sailing. And since they were traveling west, after circumnavigating, they actually rotated around the Earth's axis exactly one less night than if they'd remained in Spain. This caused great excitement, and a special delegation was sent to the Pope to explain this oddity to him. It had obviously been an immense ordeal for the men. In crossing the Pacific, many men had died of scurvy, and others suffered so appallingly from thirst and hunger that they ate sawdust, leather, and rats. Sailing up the coast of Africa, 20 men in the Victoria died of starvation alone. So we saw 270 brave men left Spain in five small ships or caravels. The ships were of different sizes, but typically they had broad beams and three masts with square sails. They were between 100 and 200 yeah. tons weight each. The crews had a monotonous diet of bread, meat, porridge and wine of which they got a little more on feast days. It was a grim life, poor sleeping conditions, and a pervasive smell of rotting and salted fish. There were plenty of pests with rats, lots, cockroaches, bed bugs, and weevils. Water was limited, there was none for washing. Their clothes were rough and unclean, and of course they suffered from scurvy and other diseases. Discipline was harsh, and Magellan was willing to be ruthless if necessary. Compare that to a lovely voyage on the Nordan.
<laughs> the course that Magellan charted was followed by other navigators, all of whom met with failure until the British navigator and the British sailor Sir Francis Drake, more than 50 years later, appeared on the scene. Drake arrived back in England with gold plundered from the Spanish and, of course, six tons of clothes. He was the first commander of an expedition to see his expedition sail around the world. Other Spanish explorers followed, and in 1565, an expedition sailed across the Pacific from Mexico and took possession of the islands known as the Philippines after the Spanish king. The Philippines remained the Spanish possession for the next two and a half centuries. The Spanish then headed south looking for the Great Southland, the fabled land of Ophir, where by legend King Solomon's mines had provided gold to build the Temple of Jerusalem. They discovered instead the Solomon Islands and Torres Strait that separates Australia and New Guinea. But they didn't realise that the land they saw to the south of the Torres Strait was actually Australia, the Great South Land. Let's look at another great explorer, Abel Tasman. After the Portuguese, the Dutch wanted to get in on this lucrative spice trade. And in the early 17th century, began sending their ships around Africa to the Spice Islands. Of course, the Dutch weren't constrained by the Treaty of Tordesillas. That was none of their business. They established a trading company in what they called the East Indies, which of course is now Indonesia, and eventually supplanted the Portuguese. They established their capital in Batavia, now Jakarta, on the island of Java. They realised that the best way to get to the Indies, Indies was to sail across the Indian Ocean at a latitude of about 40 degrees south, where the winds there, now known as the Roaring Forties, would carry them much more quickly than if they followed the northerly course. Then at the appropriate time, they turned north, heading for the Indies. Well, inevitably what happened was that if they miscalculated slightly all the blood off course, they hit the west coast of Australia which they called New Holland. They're not terribly interested in this barren desert land that they could see. No water was there. It was really not very impressive at all. This map shows several of the Dutch explorers around that time with the dates of their explorations. Eventually, in 1642, the Dutch East India Company commissioned Abel Tasman to see if he could find a route to Chile to compete with Spain and to look for the Great Southland, Terra Australis. Tasman took the traditional route, but sailed a little further south, and instead of turning north to the Indies, he kept going. Eventually he struck land, which he named Van Diemen's Land. We now call it Tasmania, the southernmost state of Australia. Sailing on in December of 1642, he sighted the mountainous coastline of the South Island of New Zealand. Pierce was the first European contact with the New Zealand Maori, who killed four of his men. Now, without him personally having set foot in New Zealand, Tasman then sailed further into the Pacific before sailing around the north coast of New Guinea and on to Batavia. So he did quite a round sweep of the area. So Tasman didn't find a route to Chile or gold or Terra Australis, and he had no financial return for his efforts. But he did discover Tasmania, New Zealand, Tonga, and Fiji. Now, what's so interesting about all of this exploration is that while Australia is a big continent, its actual existence as an island continent was missed by most seafarers for centuries. The Dutch and some others, such as the Englishman William Dampier, charted the west coast of Australia. But they didn't find the east coast or realise at the time that it was Terra Australis. I showed you that earlier with some of those Dutch explorers, travellers. Now up to the end of the 17th century, the explorers had usually been driven by the lure of finding great wealth. But in the 18th century, some explorers undertook their missions either for national prestige, waving the flag, or because of a thirst for knowledge. So this was the period of scientific exploration. Also by the 18th century, the Portuguese, Spanish, and Dutch empires were in gentle decline, overtaken 
at this time by the French and the British. The first French expedition was led by Louis Antoine de Bougainville. Born in 1729, he was a navigator and military commander who fought in the Seven Year War against the British in North America. That element called the French an Indian War. In 1766, after the war, he received permission from King Louis XV to circumnavigate the globe and to restore French prestige by discovering Terra Australis. So he set out with two ships. He sailed through the Strait of Magellan and across the Pacific. He discovered the Society Islands, which are French to this day, it's part of French Polynesia. And continuing on, he saw the heavy breakers of the Great Barrier Reef off the north coast of Australia. But being low on supplies and enthusiasm at the time, he turned north and discovered the northern island of the Samoan of the Solomon Archipelago, known today as Bougainville. He sailed around the north coast of New Guinea and returned to France via the Indian Ocean. So Bougainville became the 14th navigator in Western history and the first Frenchman to sail around the world. And he lost only seven of his crew of more than 200 men, which was a credit to his management of that expedition. Bougainville didn't discover all the islands of the Tahiti group, but he and his crew had an idyllic encounter with the natives of Tahiti, whose charms were greater than the captain even could resist. Sick and physically disgusting from scurvy, he and his sailors were wooed and won by the cornucopia of the islands. Great weather, abundant fresh food, and beautiful women. Bougainville rhapsody extensively about this paradise and brought back to France a Tahitian of noble birth named Ahu. You might recall this morning that Phil talked about Tupaya. It was also the same category of, of a, a local who was uh, looked upon curiously by the European explorers. This all coincided with the prevailing popularity of the philosophical concept of the noble savage and cemented Tahiti's place in Europe's romanticization of primitive simplicity. That's another story about the noble savage and an interesting one at that. I might add that uh, Bougainville's statue sits very proudly in the park at Papayeti in Tahiti, for those of you who have been there. Bougainville was accompanied by a botanist, Philip, Philip Bear Coppersong, and his valet, Jean Barré, now the crew became suspicious of the relationship between the botanist and his valet. At Tahiti, the valet showed no interest in women. And the ship surgeon then unmasked the valet as a woman, Jean Barry. So Bougainville's sole official response was to grant the woman her own quarters, aware that she might become the first woman to circumnavigate the world, which indeed she did become. But the most intriguing aspect of Bougainville's voyage was that he came so close to discovering the east coast of Australia. However, by the time he saw the breakers on the reef, later known as Bougainville Reef, his ships had exhausted their supply of biscuits and salted meat, and the men were suffering badly from scurvy. So the ships then turned north, looking for an easier place to land. Had he continued on, who knows? You'd probably be getting this talk in French this morning, this afternoon. <laughs> Enter James Cook. Now, Philip this morning quite rightly pointed out that when he took off on his first voyage, Cook was actually Lieutenant Cook, and his ship was actually Her Majesty's Bark Endeavour, not Her Majesty's Ship, which would have entitled him to the title of Captain. But that's perhaps another story. I'll be doing a complete talk on Cook tomorrow, but for completeness in this presentation, I want to summarise his exploits now, if I may. Cook undertook three voyages of the Pacific, shown here a bit like Spaghetti Junction. The first voyage, in 1767 to 1770, is the one shown in red. Its mission was to observe the transit of Venus in Tahiti, then continue westward to find the elusive Terra Australis. And in the course of this mission, Cook mapped the complete coastline of New Zealand, 
discovered the east coast of Australia and claimed all that he had seen for the King of England. There's some debate at the moment about whether he discovered it or simply found it. Australia having been occupied by that stage for more than 50,000 years. The second voyage from 1972 to 1975, Shannon Green, more deliberately focused on discovering Terra Australis and took Cook almost to the mainland of Antarctica. In the process he proved that there was no Terra Australis, but he did establish the value of Harrison's chronometer for determining longitude. The final, and for Cook, fateful journey shown here in blue was from 1776 and was to find the famed Northwest Passage, which would allow ships to travel from Europe to Asia by going around the northern fringes of Canada and Alaska. While he was unsuccessful in penetrating the Bering Strait, he did come across the Hawaiian Islands. The death of Cook brought an end to this era of exploration and as he settled the major question of the shape of the Pacific anyway. It remained then for other brave adventurers to fill in all the blank spots. Many of the subsequent voyages were motivated by other particular imperatives, such as the search for whales, or sandalwood, or establishing trading partners, or simply for plunder. Another great Pacific explorer to whom Australia owes a great debt is the Englishman Matthew Flinders. Flinders had come to New South Wales in 1795 in the early days of the colony with the second governor, John Hunter. And he embarked on surveys of the coast with his colleague, the naval surgeon, George Bass. They came to public attention after becoming the first person to circumnavigate Van Diemen's land, proving it was an island and discovering the process, what is now known as Bass Strait between the Australian mainland and Tasmania. Flinders returned to Britain in 1800. With the assistance of the famous botanist Sir Joseph Banks, he was then engaged by the Admiralty to lead an expedition to circumnavigate New Holland. He was assigned a 30 metre long ship, the HMS Investigator, and a crew of 88, including scientists and artists. The expedition sailed from Portsmouth on the 18th of July, 1801 reaching Cape Lewin at the bottom of Western Australia on the 6th of December of that year. Cape Lewin is right over here. Now the, the blue line you see there is his first voyage into Australia. The red line is actually his second navigation, which I'll speak about shortly. But from his point of arrival, they sailed along the south coast and arrived in Sydney in May of 1802. On en route, they discovered that the Great Australian Bight did not connect to the Gulf of Carpentaria in the north, as was speculated. And they also discovered Kangaroo Island and St Vincent Gulf, which are now part of South Australia. They had a brief stop in Sydney for repairs, and then the expedition set out north on their epic circumnavigation in May of 1802, returning to Sydney from the west just over a year later in June of 1803, and that's the big round loop you see there. In the course of this journey, he was able to fill in the countless gaps in the map of the continent left by previous explorers. And perhaps Flinders' most notable achievement was the definition of the outline of Australia. The map of Australia he created after his ultimate circumnavigation was the basis of the official map of the country until the Second World War required an update. Flinders proved that Tasmania was an island and that Australia was one island continent. He first suggested the name Australia and was the first to use it. Later that year, he set off to return to Britain to rejoin his new wife, who, whom he'd married only three months before he departed for New South Wales. The ship he was on, the Cumberland, was forced by the need for repairs to stop at Mauritius in the Indian Ocean. This was a French possession, and at the time Britain was at war with France. Flinders and his crew were therefore considered to be enemy spies and were imprisoned for nearly seven years. He eventually rejoined his wife in October of 1810, having not seen her for over nine years, and having been only married for three months before that. 
On the 18th of July, 1814, Flinders published his record of the expedition, called Voyage to Terra Australia, with an accompanying atlas. But he died of a bladder stone infection the very next day, and he was only 40. There was another particularly blank spot, and that was Antarctica. Many explorers saw bits and pieces of Antarctica, although perhaps the first person to land there was an American sealer, Captain John Davis, who claimed to have set foot there in February of 1821. The first person to realise that he had discovered a whole continent was Charles Wilkes, the commander of the US Navy expedition. And this expedition was authorised by the US Congress in 1836, and it included naturalists, botanists, and mineralog mineralogists, mineralogist, a taxidermist, artist, and involved six vessels, much like this. Wilkes identified 1,500 miles of coastline, thus proving that Antarctica was indeed a continent. And the area of Antarctica, now known as Wilkes Land, was of course named after him. This area is now actually claimed by Australia. Wilkes' expedition also visited Fiji and the Hawaiian Islands explored the west coast of the United States, then returned by the Philippines, Borneo, Singapore, and the Cape of Good Hope. This was the last all-sail naval, naval mission to encircle the globe. Wilkes lost two ships and 28 men in the process. Now, Wilkes subsequently gained notoriety for other reasons. He was put before a court-martial for losing one of his ships and for the illegal punishment of sailors. He was acquitted of all except that of Ill illegally punishing the sailors, for which he was reprimanded. He later commanded a ship in the US Civil War and controversially stopped a British mail packet for Trent and took off it Confederate officials. Even more controversially, he overstayed a visit to Bermuda almost causing a war between Britain and the United States. When he was told he was too old for promotion to Commodore, he wrote a scathing letter to the Secretary of the US Navy. Not a very smart career move. He was court-martialed again and sentenced to a public reprimand and suspension for three years. The President, however, reduced the sentence to one year. And in 1866, he was promoted to Rear Admiral on the retired list. Now, some historians have speculated, I say speculated, that Wilkes' obsessive behaviour and hard code of shipboard discipline shaped Herman Melville's characterisation of Captain Ahab in his novel Moby Dick. Others may have a view about that. Let me conclude this once around the globe many times. By the 19th century, there was no doubt that the exploration of the Pacific Ocean was essentially complete. Exploration had come a long way since the famous Dutch cartographer Abraham Ortelius drew this map in 1570, showing the Great South Land that supposedly linked Antarctica and Australia and touched South America. The explorations had been undertaken by brave, adventurous explorers in small ships over a period of some 350 plus years. And they set the scene for the Pacific nations, some of which we have been visiting on this voyage. They did indeed explore for trade, explore for prestige, explore for all those reasons, including religion. And they set up what are now the Pacific nations, many of which became independent only very recently from their colonial masters. So it's a great story that I hope sets the scene uh, for our further exploration through the North Pacific on our way to Vancouver. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much. That's uh, uh, the end of this presentation. But before I leave the stage, I want to mention Anzac Day on Wednesday morning next, the 25th of April, which uh, is a day of special commemoration for Australians and New Zealanders. Uh, this is advertised on the front of today's uh, newsletter. Uh, it'll be at 6.30, most probably in this lounge here. Uh, the other day, uh, a few volunteers came forward and uh, offered their names to assist in that service, and I thank them very much for doing that. Uh, however, I was perhaps a bit premature in asking for too many volunteers because I now understand, which I didn't at the time, 
that Holland America has uh, distributed instructions to its ships on a standard Anzac Day service for all of the ships for conformity and uniformity uh, and we'll be complying with that of course. Uh, I might still need one or two volunteers but certainly not as many as I have. But I thank you indeed anyway for volunteering to do that and I look forward to seeing not only Australians and New Zealanders on Wednesday morning but also any other guest on board who would like to come along and join us and learn a little bit. What you can think that it's a great tradition uh, it's uh, so many times more precise than any mechanical watch can be. So again, cost the penny for the market, and quartz is much more accurate, even more accurate than the materials that were used in the Acutron. So the first uh, quartz watch was uh, made by Seiko company, and then immediately like... <laughs> Oh, my God. 
I can do the hands or the feet. <laughs> to the right, tap, go hold or to the left. Tap, go hold or to the left. I want to go back to my little to brush. Tap, in, say, all the people who are Very good, beautiful. It's okay. Very good. I want to be with all the men and women that I used to know. So long ago, listen, I can hear, I can hear the old guitars playing. Strum your guitars on the beach at home oh, now, now. Listen, I can hear, I can hear the old Hawaiian saying, now, ao iko mo wai no ko uwa ika hoile wala ka ka. Oh, nay. Very good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they like what a money. Don't forget to smile. I want to go back to my little bad shack in Kiyaki Kono Bay. Oh, they like what a money. 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 Oh, they like I can hear the guitars playing on the beach, on the beach at home now. Okay. I can hear the old woman sing. Come on, I'm looking for a light of fire. Hold on to my ship, we'll be sailing. 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 Back to Kona. A grand old place By your eyes It's always fair to see okay. I'm just a little Hawaiian girl Homesick I'm old I go back to my fish and pork Very good Okay, so you can see the temples are living from the moon Very good
Sobrang uh, mahalo, mahalo nung loa and malama pona that means thank you, thank you very much and please take care of your mind, body and soul. Aloha. 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 And because we can date the corals in the terraces, we can work out the sea levels. And in fact, the various ways of looking at sea level and sea level change over, well, that graph goes back, it was 120 metres lower. So, in a way, I'm tempted to say, good job we didn't become civilised and build our uh, cities on the seashore 15 to 20,000 years ago because they would well and truly be underwater now. So, uh, very important to understand what's happening with the changes in sea level. Uh, okay, corals, I did mention the human terraces, but coral growth rings actually also provide a very good idea of what you're what doing is going to strike the people behind you. Uh, okay, okay. Just by Sorry. measuring, this is mainly with okay, okay. the ocean temperatures. Knowledge of Earth's climate history is essential to understanding modern climate change and to projecting likely future impacts. Answering questions pertaining to the rate and magnitude of climate variability over the past 1,000 years and beyond is critical to distinguish between natural and human-induced climate change today. Reliable and shown up records of climate change are available only for the last 150 years. Do they have paleoclimate information or past climate records stretching back thousands of years? Scientists use Earth's geologic record. Trees, ice cores, corals, and shelled microorganisms are natural archives that store climate information. For example, ice cores trap gas bubbles at specific layers. The gas can be analyzed for past atmospheric carbon dioxide concentrations. Trees grow really lit by adding concentric rings to their trunks. The rings vary in size depending on environmental conditions like rainfall. However, for these archives or proxy records to be of use in studying climate change, they must be calibrated to modern environmental conditions. Jessica Spears, a geologist at the USGS in St. Petersburg, Florida, is part of a project team working to develop such calibrations. So calibration is mathematically aligned proxy data, like the width of a tree ring, to something known, like instrumental data, such as the amount of rainfall. For example, the width of a tree ring doesn't itself tell you how much it rained in a particular year, but we can calibrate the ring width to rainfall measurements in a specific location over the same interval of time and use that relation to convert bits of fossil tree rings to past rainfall. The USGS is conducting a proxy calibration study in the Gulf of Mexico to develop a relation between the chemical composition of plankton forams and modern low latitude environmental conditions. Plankton foraminifera, or forams for short, are these microscopic unicellular organisms that live within the water column and they build a calcium carbonate shell that chemically records the conditions of their ocean habitat. So when the ocean temperature increases, the form will actually substitute magnesium for calcium into its shell and thereby record the change in temperature. So in effect, the higher the ocean temperature, the greater is the ratio between magnesium to calcium in its shell, and the lower the temperature, the smaller is the ratio. Okay, the video actually did go on for several more minutes after that. The, the, the gist of it was, is that uh, with the present day conditions, we have that uh, sort of calibration. When we then go back to the fossil record and look at the four hours from the fossil record, then we've got an idea of the water temperature and the climate then. So, a um, couple more examples of uh, what uh, scientists can use to help determine uh, past climates. Uh, one that's in fact, uh, I guess, gaining in, in popularity and use are uh, speleothems. Speleothems are sort of cave deposits of various sort, shapes and sizes, uh, particularly, as I mentioned there, stalagmites, stalactites, and the flow stones that you get on the floor of caves. By uh, dating, say with a, a cross section uh, there through, a, uh, either a stalagmite or stalactite, uh, knowing the ages and then analyzing each particular ring, uh, we've got an idea mainly with the carbon and the oxygen isotopes. Again, that gives us the information with the oxygen on the uh, temperature. Carbon isotopes 
tell me more about the vegetation or at least an indication of what may have been around at that time. They go back maybe about uh, half a million years, uh, but people, they keep getting it pushed back, so I think it's going to be more and more useful. It's really a case of the techniques that are being used to uh, determine what the conditions were. And uh, just I think the last two, palynology, the uh, looking at the, the spores and pollen. Uh, a lot of them you get in the uh, sort of marshy areas, uh, a lot easier to do a core. And you see two people there working to get a core from that marsh. One of the areas in Australia that has got a very good uh, core sample looking at uh, past vegetation is up on the Atherton Tablelands, just uh, west of Cairns, close called Lynch's Crater. And the record goes back about 75,000 years. And what they found is it, it, it has varied. Sometimes you've got the, uh, the wet rainforest there, sometimes in drier conditions, the rainforest has retreated. And we can tell that from the, mainly from the pollen that comes from the core. And then the uh, last example, uh, dendrochronology, is uh, was mentioned very briefly in that little video clip. And it just as a, I guess, a point of interest, um, that the area there between, I know we roughly about uh, 1000 AD and about sort of 1300, 1400 AD, that was a period when Greenland was settled and the, when the Norse established their, uh, their colony in Greenland, it was in very much in a warm period. And then as the conditions worsened, they eventually abandoned their settlement. So there we are, that was just sort of a, a brief view, I guess an overview really, of uh, climate, how the earth scientists can help. So the rest of the talk, I would like to talk about what I would call geohazards. Um, as I say, the main three that I will be talking about are those three at the top, and then just briefly touching on those last four at the end. Okay, so uh, given where we are, and uh, probably somewhere up on the Pacific Plate here and heading northwards, I thought I mean, there's numerous examples I could give, but I, I thought probably the most relevant one is uh, Christchurch. And I say poor Christchurch, it really demonstrates what liquefaction is about and the damage it can do. from the New Zealand Geological Survey.
Just looking at say, the Indian oil there of uh, Sumatra and Banda Aceh and then spread through the Indian Ocean. The one point I'd like to make from this is that uh, geologists who have studied uh, cave sediments about three to four kilometers inland from the coast of Banda Aceh have actually found uh, well, I was going to say, an interesting sequence of sediments in that you'll have cave deposits, then you'll have tsunami, you'll have sand deposits, then more cave deposits, and so on. And the scary thing is that with the tsunami deposits, they often appear to come in pairs. So, you know, you could maybe be a little bit worried that uh, is this the first of two major tsunamis. We don't know, but it's certainly something we should be prepared for. And then, more recently, the Japanese one, and again, I've got a nice little video. Just a couple of points I'd like to make about that is, is that I, I didn't get the impression from that was, oh, you know, what a shock, what a surprise. Well, sorry, no, it isn't a surprise. We know the Japanese have got records, I just mentioned, dating back at least before the San Riku earthquake and tsunami in, that was 896, yeah, 898, 96. So that's more than, what are we, 1100 years of records. They know how far inland the uh, tsunamis go, so this surprise, gee, it went six miles inland. Well, sorry, that's not a surprise to geologists. They're in for lesson. But uh, the other point I want to make is in regard to Fukushima, the nuclear plant. They, they put their nuclear plant on the eastern side of Japan where you get tsunamis. I don't know why they don't put it on the western side, 
Well, you don't get tsunami food. Put your hand up in the east, that's okay, fine. But if you know you get tsunamis that can be at least eight to 10 meters high, why do you build a wall only six meters high around your nuclear plant? I mean, I'm sorry, you know, it doesn't make sense to me, but that's me. Um, I did show this slide when I talked about uh, rafting and plants and animals that can hitch rides on various things going across the Pacific. And uh, this was one as a result of the tsunami where a number of marine species hitched rides on bits of debris and a few years later finished up on the west coast of the US and also Canada as well. But um, just in case you think I'm being a bit, you know, whatever, um, I don't think we do a very good job in Australia about preparing for possible tsunamis. This is maybe a little fanciful, but maybe it's not. Uh, work has been done by a recently retired professor at the University of Wollongong. And his view is that there have been at least six major tsunamis on the east coast of Australia in the last 10,000 years. He believes he has evidence that uh, these tsunamis reached at least 10 kilometers inland, which if you think about Sydney, you're maybe not getting as far as Parramatta, but you're certainly getting a long way up the river there. Um, Certainly on the west coast of Australia, in West Australia, you do get some impacts, particularly from when you've had a tsunami uh, in Indonesia, it will have had an impact in WA, but usually not too much. But on the east coast, most of the tsunamis, or should I say possible tsunamis, are probably being created by underwater landslides, much like that Sporega slide in Norway. And they recently did a, a very detailed survey, uh, just that's the sort of the barrier reef there, the fairly flat bit. Then there's a very steep slope down to the Tasman Sea and the floor. And what they found, there were things called these Gloria Knolls. And they're these sort of, I guess, sort of small underwater knolls. Well, they're not sort of small, underwater knolls. They know from corals on the top of them that these knolls are at least 300,000 years old. And that they seem to coincide with some major slippages of an area just off the coast, that's in Israel. The thing that I find a bit scary is that they estimate that a slide of that magnitude would have generated a tsunami at least eight meters high. And when you think of all the major Queensland cities that are on the coast, from sort of Cairns, Townsville, what are we, sort of coming down uh, Gladstone, Rockhampton, Mackay, even down to Brisbane, uh, what the impact of a tsunami on Queensland would be. So, you know, I, I think we have to uh, be prepared for something like this. People need to do more work. What are the chances of this happening? So I'll come to the, I guess, the last of the big three, as far as, I guess, uh, destruction is concerned. And uh, these are the volcanoes. I'll just start with the ones in Hawaii, which in terms of their explosivity, I guess it is fairly small. They, they, most of them, they move but fairly slowly. Uh, Stromboli off the Italian coast is on the Aeolian Islands, sort of huffs and puffs a bit, but uh, nothing too serious. The, uh, the one in Iceland, the, uh, the one whose name I can never pronounce, but I always say something, I have the Yaka Yaku. But, yeah. I'm not sure whether I'm right or not, but it's, I think if I say it quickly enough, you know, people know. Um, anyway, that was, that was a four. Now that was the one that generated a huge amount of ash, created absolute chaos for plane flights across the Atlantic and through Europe for about a week. So, you know, they can have an impact even if it's not uh, destruction of life and property. 
just generally on uh, the modern world we live in. It's uh, fairly severe. But uh, the example I, I'd like to come to is uh, Max and Helen's. Now this is a five. There is a certain fears in the most geologists that we work around these volcanoes. As we all know that if, you, if you're going to work around one that's getting ready to rock, there's, there's some risk. Richard's colleague, David Johnson, was also on the mountain. David Johnson was up in this ridge, you know, just a quarter mile from where we are now, and he was monitoring what's in Helms in the official capacity. David had parked his trailer in front of the volcano's north flank to keep an eye on an ominous scrolling bulge. That same day, amateur photographer Keith Ronholm made his way to a scenic spot, also overlooking the volcano's north flank. The water trailer meadow where I was 28 years ago in 1980, I was 10 miles from the mountain. It seemed like a perfectly safe place to be. But just after 8.30 that morning, the last of a series of earthquakes hit, triggering one of the largest landslides in recorded history. <laughs> in motion was sliding down and it's it such an unbelievable view that I, I shook my head and I said am I, am I really seeing this Indonesia, I'll give an example of a seven. This is one called Tambora. This is just, uh, well, a few years, at least geologically, a few years before um, you know, Krakatoa. And I was going to say, just, just, just to show you that we geologists, you know, do have a bit of culture with us. There's a, one of Turner's paintings, uh, Turner, the great British landscape uh, painter. A lot of these paintings you'll see have, have sort of sunsets and this sort of yellowy sort of glow in the sky. And that yellowy glow really relates to sulfur and sulfur compounds that uh, were, came from Tambora when it erupted. So that's, uh, that's the reason when you look at Turner's paintings, think volcanoes. 